The world is changed. I feel it in the water. I feel it in the earth. I smell it in the air. Much that once was is lost. For none now live who remember it. Welcome to the Knights of Christendom, standing for the truth of Western civilization, the Holy Mother Church, and our Lord and our King Jesus Christ in the face of a godless liberty. Today I'm joined with my good friend Anthony Chioza as we're going to be talking about a topic that nobody across the Western world seems to want to address, and that is that in America now, atheism is the largest religion in this country. They have surpassed the number of Catholics in this country, as well as Protestants, according to the Daily Wire. This is what it says, for the first time in history, atheists constitute the largest religious group in America. According to the General Social Survey, the number of Americans who have no religion has increased 266% over the past three decades, and now account for 23 0.1% of the population, just barely edging out Catholics and Evangelicals as the nation's most dominant faith. Mainline Protestant churches have suffered the greatest collapse, declining 62.5% since 1982 and now comprising just 10.8% of the U.S. population. Uh, Anthony, my friend, these are just absolutely devastating numbers, in my opinion. I think it highlights that we are in, in the midst of the great apostasy. Now, I'm not here to judge God's will in any kind of way, but we've been kind of trending this way in Western civilization now for the past 50, 60 years. I know for many years, Americans kind of made fun, or should I say, conservatives made fun of Europeans for having lost the faith. And yet, as I've been arguing for a long time, it was only a matter of time until Americans caught up. Listen, uh, say what you want, but, you know, culturally, politically, and even for the family, now that atheists really comprise really the, the largest religion in this country, it's bad news all the way across, don't you think? True, yes. Uh, it, it, none of it is good, that's for sure. Um, and the losses are really telling, uh, especially where they're coming from. As a matter of fact, before we uh, started up this episode, I did a little scouting around just to see what the current vibe is within the atheist community, and I came across a young man's YouTube channel, and he is a former Baptist, and uh, he saw the errors within Sola Scriptura. Uh, they were just kind of blaring out at him, and he couldn't really ignore it anymore, and so he went on a search for truth. And uh, the truth he found was in atheism, and uh, those arguments seem to make the most sense to him. And so I think we need to draw some distinctions, first of all, is that uh, I'm concerned about the numbers because it, I, I have to believe that some of these people are not really considering like the teleological arguments or the ontological arguments. It's just convenient for them to walk away from things that are demanding. So uh, Protestantism is really Catholicism light. It, it's not overly demanding. It's once saved, always saved. Not to say that some of them, some of them do try to avoid easy believism, quote unquote. But that said, there's a vast difference between uh, being Catholic and that. Catholics, if they're good Catholics, constantly have to assess their conscience. They have to go to confession. They have to be very honest with themselves because they know they're going to stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. 
So it's, it's not surprising to me that we're seeing these losses in Protestantism, especially among the young when they go away to university and they're exposed to ideas that they've never been exposed to before, and the argumentation seems sound in their minds. So I believe distinctions are important, though, and I think a lot of what we're seeing in, in that data is probably related more to convenience, and they never really perhaps had... Uh, much faith to begin with anyway. It's it's definitely, I'd be interested to know the ages, Frank, because I have a feeling it's probably a lot of young people. Yeah, I, I'm in the camp that believes this is a generational problem, and it's the natural devolution of post-enlightenment society. And as sort of our passions have been inflamed because of these personal liberties without any sort of um, mechanisms of faith tied to our system of governance and our culture where every individual is free sort of to pursue his own passions without any dictates or standards from say a church that is the overarching standard over civilization it was only going to be a matter of time until the whole thing uh, you know kind of broke down and i think we've been seeing this coming now for several decades at the very least. Now, I would say America, in many respects, would have apostatized, and these numbers would have been worse a long time ago if it wasn't for Catholicism in, in really between the 20s and the 50s. Because we had a lot of immigration coming to America from Europe, specifically from Ireland and from Sicily that brought the Catholic faith. And really up until Vatican II, and I think Vatican II is the key date here when we talk about Catholics, you saw America really start to flourish in many ways. Because the churches were being built, the vocations for the priesthood and the nuns were, were skyrocketing. The, the churches weren't being built fast enough. And then Vatican II comes along and we begin to see the debacle. And we've talked about that before and we'll elaborate some more. But my point being here is, is I think America's history is desperately tied to its puritanical Calvinist past that I believe presents a lot of problems in the history of this country. Catholicism, like I said, I think... In that period of time, about a 40, 50 year period, does a lot of good by invoking its values. But eventually, as the Catholic faith starts to collapse after Vatican II, really all of Christianity takes a nosedive in America. But ultimately what this means to me, Anthony, is, is that we are on a trajectory that now is seeing the faith collapse all over the world. And I'll say this, for many those on the political right, that for many years when I was in the political right movement, in the conservative movement, used to boast about how America was much more conservative, much more religious than, say, our European ancestors. You know, I, my argument was, always was, well, listen, we've had the pond that has connected us, or should I say, has protected us from sort of that communist infiltration that's happened in European nations. It's only a matter of time. And it's only a matter of time, not only because of the communist infiltration, but because the heart of Christianity, the heart of the, of the Christian world and the Catholic world comes from Europe. It always did. Without Europe, there is no Christianity. There is no Catholicism. The, the faith doesn't exist. If Americans want to believe somehow that they're better Christians than the Europeans, and they think that, and their form of Christianity, Anthony, can survive without Europe, I mean that that is the height of this false notion of indifferentism that we pushed in this country now since its founding. That they can make no connection as to the major fallacies of that idea, and now we have a bunch of individuals who've taken religion sort of in any way they want, create a religion out of thin air, and all of a sudden now we're finding out that, you know what, nobody believes in anything anymore, Anthony. Right, and Frank, you touched on something there that I believe is incredibly important. If we think to the letter that Pope Emeritus just recently released, and of course he got all kinds of flack from the German bishops, which, which was completely ridiculous, he points to uh, the 60s, and essentially what he's pointing to is hedonism. And this has been across the board, especially with the advent of birth control. We have to understand that the, the pleasure principle itself and how it actually affects the brain. Now, you know, for my atheistic friends out there, I mean, this is straight up science. You can look at uh, health.harvard.edu for this. 
And uh, I'll just quote, the brain registers all pleasure in the same way, whether they originate with psychoactive drugs, a monetary reward, a sexual encounter, or a satisfying meal. In the brain, pleasure has a distinct signature, the release of the neurotransmitter dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, a cluster of nerve cells lying underneath the cerebral cortex. So what they're saying is that uh, all of these different types of pleasure, it all is registering the same way in the brain, and it leads to addiction. And these addictions are, uh, are a problem with our society. It's become very hedonistic, and I think atheism at least the type of atheism I believe they're talking about. I'm not talking about people who are atheists based on principles they've carefully thought out. Uh, I do respect people's intellectual honesty. However, I, I think we have to really look at the situation and say, well, you know, it's much easier to walk away from a faith that's demanding on you to rein yourself in and control your passions rather than uh, you know, actually man up and deal with those things. Now, the funny thing is, is one of the atheists I was listening to, he talked about how atheists are actually happier, and he gave some stats in different countries, and I just thought to myself, well, you know, first of all, for the audience, in case they don't know, I used to be atheist myself, and I thought to myself, well, yeah, no duh, you tend to be kind of happy if you're able to do whatever the hell you want to do. But that... Christianity makes heavy demands, and it actually turns you into a real, uh, a real functional human being that's able to suffer for other people and truly love other people. And in fact, uh, with atheism comes the possibility of delving into all types of hedonistic behavior. Not that all of them do, but it's a certain, it's a possibility, and uh, one I think that happens more often than not. And this is very damaging to the brain. Now, there have been other studies that show this can actually be healed. As a matter of fact, and it's funny when Protestants cite this study because they don't tell you that it's Catholic monks and nuns that participated in the study. I believe they were actually praying the rosary. Uh, and it shows that the brain was healed uh, through prayer. And that there's all kinds of activation in the uh, frontal cortex of the brain during these um, during the prayer itself and, and as you're communicating with God <clears throat> now of course scientifically speaking we don't really know per se if, if you can't say in a study like oh well they're definitely communicating with God nonetheless it's it's incredibly interesting and interesting that the brain can be healed that way so I think that's something that we have to keep in mind, and it's 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 a good. I, I like that you touched on that, Frank, because it's incredibly important. As a matter of fact, I'm going to come back to it momentarily. But uh, I mean, it's just it's what you, everything you've said about Europe and America, and and uh, yeah, we America has no room to talk anymore. Really don't. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, uh, what's his name, Matt Frad, I believe his name is, who does the things on pornography and talks about the effects on the brain and the damage that pornography does to to the brain, especially in the, the front part that you just mentioned. There. I forget the name of that part of the brain, but um, but he talks about that, but how there could be a healing process once an individual sort of kind of removes himself from the porn lifestyle, and it, it takes about 18 months or so. But I think you're right in the sense that, Listen, we're a pleasure-based society, and and once you become sort of deep entrenched in that pleasure-based society, it's hard to acknowledge a God that makes so many demands of you. And again, I think what you said earlier about Protestantism, about this easy-peasy, faith-alone kind of Christianity, I think presents another problem in itself, but it, it, when you're not asked to overcome your sins within the realm of Christianity, it's when I begin to start to sort of see these red flags. And I think with many Protestants, that's one of the fundamental problems that they have. And in many ways, it's why they've attracted so many people, particularly away from the old line Protestant churches. And a lot of Catholics as well, too, have left for this sort of easy peasy, non demand kind of religion. And so, in that sense, I think we're seeing a gravitation and a shift under the guise of religious liberty to give people a choice and an option that 
uh, appears or at least gives them the ability to adjust within the midst of their passions without really totally surrendering to God other than whatever surrender means in their own minds. And Protestantism, along with sort of this rock band, strip mall Protestantism, uh, I think plays a big role in that. And it's why evangelicalism has really skyrocketed in America. That, and I think also too, I think what's happened with Protestantism is important historically. And that is because it was an empty shell of, like you said, Anthony, sort of this Catholicism light religion. I think it left many dry and empty. And a sort of the erroneous spirit of the sort of the Reformation has come back to hunt them. And now Protestants always have to constantly reinvent themselves. And now we get, you know, all of the evangelical churches that have become sort of, you know, sort of the mainstay of Protestantism now. Now, you know, when you look at the evangelical churches, uh, Anthony, the, the, they're growing, but they do have their own problems within their own ranks. And I, I've even heard studies within, you know, that they've conducted themselves that 80% of, of evangelicals don't really hang out in these churches anymore because there's a fundamental problem here, I think, with the evangelical churches and all of Protestantism. If you can dictate to yourself and believe that God dictates his eternal truth to through sola scriptura, then why do you need to go to church anyways? I mean, I can't tell you how many Bible-believing Protestants that I know that have declared that all churches have been corrupted and that the only way to God is their own personal interpretation of the Bible, going down in their basements, hiding out, and they're the only ones that have found this eternal truth. And I think what's happened related to the study, Anthony, it's reverberated. And, and like I've said so many times on my own podcast, really Protestantism is the first step towards atheism. It really is. I'm not saying that all Protestants go down that route or become atheists, but it's a natural devolution of sort of Protestant theology that is, well, it's really incomplete Catholicism is what it is. And it's that empty shell once you get deep into the sort of this this theology or lack of theology that exists within Protestantism. That's why I think the, 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 the atheists that left, you know, sort of the Baptist church in that sense, that you brought up is a very fascinating story because I believe Protestantism is the road to atheism. And I believe that's why we're having the problems we have, at least in America today. Yes. And I think that you look at Protestantism, it's essentially morally relativistic because eventually each branch of Protestantism will, uh, it, it will violate its own principles that it set forth. And then there will be a split and so this happens over and over and over and over again. And, uh, you know, you may live your life by a certain code of conduct, and you may even manage not to flip on a dime. But from Christ's lens, the rejection of some of his laws is moral relativism. Um, and, and people could say that about the Catholic Church's beliefs. But, you know, I believe that Jesus is who he said he was. I believe he is, in fact, the Logos made manifest and this is where the very authority comes from that gives me the ability to say, I'm not the one that's the moral relativist. You know, the, the dogma has to exist for the idea of moral relativism to exist outside of a culturally like subjective form. Because otherwise, there's no constant to compare relativistic thought to in its absence. Uh, when Moses was handed the law from God... Uh, he never said, you know, Moses never said, this is the law I created, or this is my law. He said, this is the law God gave him. And Jesus further points this out in the New Testament, that the Pharisees themselves don't believe that Moses wrote the Old Testament. And if they had believed it, they would have, you know, led their lives very differently. And so, you know, the Pharisees were morally relativistic as well. Uh, they followed the letter of the law for their own gain, but not the heart of the law. And so, you know, there is the general definition of moral relativism being subjective based on whatever particular culture one happens to be a part of. But that's, you know, not what I'm speaking about. And so I think we have good evidence to suggest that the Catholic Church actually is what she claims to be. And um, 
you know, a lot of people might be listening to us right now and saying, well, where do you get the authority to say these things? And so there's several different lines of reasoning we can go down, but I think the strongest one, especially for atheists and even Protestants, really, is uh, there is as close as you can get to a miracle that occurred. Um, well, I mean, as close as you can get to something, uh, as close as you can get to a miracle that is false, potentially falsifiable. So in one sense, it is totally falsifiable. And uh, atheists should definitely look at this. Now, there are some problems with it from an atheistic perspective, perhaps. Uh, number one, you'd be looking at it through a Catholic lens. Number two, um, it's, it doesn't appear in any journal that's peer-reviewed. However, it's still compelling. And so I just would like to talk about that for just a second. And now this comes from churchmilitant.com and this article is from a few years ago, I believe. And uh, it's, it, it says, I quote, after a scientific investigation, a Eucharistic miracle in Poland was recently confirmed as authentic by the local bishop of the area. Initially, the host had fallen on the ground, so it was placed in water as is customarily done in such cases. Now, for those of you that don't know, the host is what is uh, what looks like bread, but is actually the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Now, not long afterward, the Eucharistic uh, the Eucharist began turning red as if it was bloody. Now, you know, in some cases, this can be mold, and this happens every once in a while, and it's tested, and it's like, okay, well, it's it's a mold. In this case, it was not. As a matter of fact, in this case. It happened to be a rare AB positive type, and uh, it also they also found the DNA, and it seemed to come from the heart. Now there was a uh, doctor that was involved in this, Dr. Friedrich uh, Zugby. He's an esteemed cardiologist and forensic pathologist at Columbia University in New York, and um, another doctor, Dr. Castanon, uh, uh, he brought the samples to. Dr. Zugby, and he was reportedly amazed that, that when he studied the samples, they were pulsating like a living heart. They were so, in other words, they were alive. The tissue sample was alive. Uh, the one uh, that came from, um, I believe, Poland. And so, after the results were compared, uh, the sample from Poland, and then another sample from uh, Lanciato, Italy, which is from 1,300 years ago. So two different samples. They both turned out to be AB positive and they both had the exact same DNA. And this caused, it was Dr. Castanano, it caused him to convert and become Catholic. So you have an atheistic doctor that converts when he sees this miracle with his own eyes. And of course the other scientist is uh, flabbergasted as well. It was completely incredible. Now, you know, atheists that are completely hardcore will cite all of these, all of the minutia, you know, never mind that the scientific method worked here. Yes, could it be repeated? Absolutely, it could be repeated. Does it need to be repeated? I'd be happy if it was. But, I mean, for me, that's enough evidence for like a hardcore atheist that's a scientist that studies this, they say what they see, what they've observed, and they convert. Well, you know, to me, that's pretty serious stuff. That's enough authority for me to be able to judge who is actually morally relativistic and who has the narrow gate, Frank. And that's what it really comes back to. It comes back to the narrow gate. Many people do not want to do those hard things that it takes to get into heaven, and that means giving up those pleasures. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring that story up because I think apart from the 2,000 year analogy of the faith, which really defines our pedigree as Catholics, uh, not only does it prove our faith, not only does it prove our civilization was built off sort of the, this, you know, Catholic analogy of the faith, but it really destroys the Protestant model of history in many ways. And so, um, but I think, you know, again, of the many ways that we can highlight sort of the role that Catholicism has played, you brought in another aspect of this. And while we have this, again, analogy of the faith, 
Uh, we have the testimony of the of the doctors of the church, the testimony of the history of the church, uh, the, the the saints of the church and their testimonies, the popes and sort of this unbroken line of succession, you know, sort of within the history of the church through the clergy and the laity. They've all believed one and the same thing for 2,000 years. Now you bring into it the, the element of the miracle, which is, again, God's gift to highlight sort of his being and his existence to show all of us. And there's been so many of these miracles. And it's the one thing that I think Protestants truly lack. And because they're not institutionalized, they may claim some individualistic miracles, but in no way do they have the mechanism like Catholics have had historically to highlight the miracles that, that have taken place for 2,000 years, record them, document them, and then definitively give proof as to this is what happened. I mean, we've had the stigmatists, we've had the saints, we've had all kinds of events, you know, over the course of Christianity that highlights that Catholics can gravitate toward to find faith. You bring up the bleeding host. It's one example. You know, Padre Pew was a stigmatist. Uh, you know, this was a man that bled with the five wounds of Jesus Christ. I mean, there are many sort of uh, these mystics that exist all over the world that people can find to this very day in every generation God gives us mystics to remind us of who he is and that he's still there and these are God's messengers for us God always trying to communicate for us I know many people want the trumpets you know from the clouds and the heavens above to prove to them Anthony that somehow God exists but it's not his method it's not how he's always worked whether it's Our Lady of Good Success which is the great prophecy for our generation in our time, or Our Lady of Fatima, or the stigmatism of Padre Pew, or the bleeding host in Poland, God is always revealing himself. Yes, we have a mainstream media that hides this. Yes, we have a mainstream media that ignores this. But if individuals want to see this for themselves, it's right there in front of our very eyes, my friend. Yes, Frank, and interestingly enough, you bring up the idea of mystery. And mystery seems to be a problem for both atheists and for Protestants. And the thing about that is, that's striking, is that atheists hold to pure reason, and Protestants hold to pure faith. And these are both errors. Uh, we need faith and reason. And mystery doesn't mean that we can't understand part of the mystery. We do understand some of the mysteries, but there are aspects of it that we don't no, and some things we aren't ever going to know, even when we go to heaven, and even after we have our glorified body and the earth is renewed, there are still certain things we won't have knowledge of. And so there's always going to be some mystery, and uh, they have problems with that on both sides of the aisle in that regard. Now, I would like to go back just briefly to the idea of the kind of hedonism and the pleasure that we seek here in the United States it has been so uh, open to us. Because I, re I really want to drive this home for people that don't understand what they might be doing to themselves if they happen to be listening to this. Uh, it's, it's very important that they understand how these types of behaviors can be so destructive. So I'm going to play a brief clip from The Minds of Men. It's an official documentary by Aaron and Melissa Dykes. And they get into a lot of the studies that were done here in the United States on um, not, just, not just rats, which we're about to hear about, but unfortunately also human beings. There's some very disgusting stuff that's going on here. Nonetheless, some interesting things have been uncovered. So let's take a listen to that very quickly. Dental at first, Olds and Milner had discovered the so-called pleasure center of the brain through an extension of the technique Wilder Pinfield first developed. A new window on the brain was opened in 1953, when a rat fortuitously evidenced a neuro-rewarding effect. By returning to the place where he had been when an electrical stimulus was applied to the brain via chronically implanted electrodes. In terms of conditioned behavior, this electrically induced reward became an end unto itself. 
1954, Olds created a reward map of the brain featuring locations where electrical stimulation caused mammals to come back for more. The reward map held true for rats, cats, monkeys, and humans. By 1961, James Olds, who'd been attending Macy's sister conferences on the central nervous system during the late 50s alongside Frank Fremont Smith, Howard Liddell, and other cybernetics acolytes, made history after he implanted an electrode into the pleasure center of a lab rat's brain and conditioned it to trigger its own self-satisfying electrical stimulation. This is a device which trains the animal to turn on the stimulus for himself. Here you notice the animal wandering toward the pedal. When he first touches it, he gets no stimulation. It's not connected yet. By pressing a simple lever. Then one time he touches the pedal, it does turn on the stimulation. You can see the lights go on. Within this cybernetic loop of electric stimulus and reward, Olds and Milner's experimental rats quickly succumb to self-stimulating their own brains repeatedly, thousands of times, foregoing their own natural drives for hunger, sex, and even willingly enduring immense pain. Now, I will electrify the grid. The animal must cross an area that gives a very painful shock to the feet in order to get to the pedal and stimulate the brain. Rats implanted with these electrodes continue to push and push and push the lever again and again and again, even until the point of death, just to receive this stimulating electrical reward. So, even until the point of death, even until the point of death to get this reward, the rats kept pressing that button to stimulate the pleasure center of their brain. Now, that has some serious consequences for atheists to consider. And how do you pragmatically go about stopping that kind of thing within the human organism? Well, the Catholic Church has had an answer for that for 2,000 years. Yeah, and I think, Anthony, you're right with that. And that's why, you know, we're called to make sacrifices in our Catholic faith. Sacrifices that a lot of people don't understand. That's for our own benefits. And so, but I think you're right. I think in a hedonistic culture, a paganized culture, where we don't acknowledge any truth anymore, the truth of the divine. And this is where I think the atheist thing gets interesting to me, and where the Protestant thing kind of interrelates as well, too. Because I believe, Anthony, that through the protestant reformation is where we began to go down a different path of human history particularly with this focus on individualism and individual conscience and every individual follows his own conscience and then religion playing a secondary role how you know sort of religion could be molded into whatever shape every individual wants and i think we see this very clearly in the pagan world we live in atheists that we live in like you're bringing up but i think we see it also in protestantism and this is why many of the great moral issues uh, that have been surrendered by Protestants over the past century alone, whether it's the divorce and remarriage issue, whether it's the contraception issue. I mean, you go down the line. I mean, they've been good on some things like homosexuality and things like that in some of these evangelical churches. But for the most part, they've begun to surrender a long time ago with these pleasure issues. And it's like I've always said before, the biggest battle mankind has always faced, it starts right there at the Garden of Eden. It starts, you know, sort of with man's pride. And, uh, and old to me, man fighting sin. And this is the battle that man has always fought. How can I keep my sins and, and ultimately renegotiate the covenant of God so where I could promise myself salvation? Uh, the Protestants have dealt with that. And this is why I think it's big when we look at these Protestant numbers, when they've gone from 60 2.5% of the population in America since 19, I think it was 1982, down to just 10.8%. There's a greater problem here that I'm seeing, Anthony, and that is the collapse of old line mainstream Protestant churches, all for this new and improved evangelicalism. And I'm telling you right now, listen, the, the great split between the Protestants and the Catholics happened with the old line ma mainstream sort of conceptual ideas of theology. If those are no longer valid, if more and more Protestants are banning those for this new and improved modern Christianity with, you know, stadium seating and, and, and rock concerts and rock bands in the in the strip malls now. What does that say for the original movement of the Protestant Reformation where so many Protestants are still dependent on, not only for legitimacy, but even where they get their, their beloved Bible that they proclaim is the only word of God, where they find truth. How does that affect them, Anthony? Well, it, it affects them in 
an incredibly negative way. I mean, if we just look at the evangelicals, for instance, as you bring up, I don't have the stats in front of me, but, you know, there's this big transfer over to them. But then if you look at the numbers there, they're falling apart as well. And so as the evangelical numbers fall apart, I think it's only natural that you see this increase towards um, uh, atheism within the culture. Uh, cultural atheism itself as well, not necessarily strict atheism. That said, you also have to look at what's happening on the other end of the stick. A lot of those uh, folks that are at the top echelons of the major theology departments within those uh, Protestant sects are becoming Catholic now. And it's some of the big thinkers. And so it really leaves a vacuum there uh, within the evangelical communities. It's, it's incredible, Frank. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. And what is the old saying? Something like Protestants take weak Catholics, but Catholics take strong Protestants. And I think this is what we've seen. I think there's an intellectual class uh, of people that are in the higher sort of echelons of education, like you just mentioned, that are, that are gravitating toward Catholicism. Well, I believe evangelicalism is sort of the lower educated masses that are looking for emotional appeals toward sort of their faith to accommodate their lives. I think that's very clear at this point in history. But I think also, too, when we look at, you know, these numbers, another thing that shocked me, was how since 1982, while mainline Protestants have collapsed from 65.8% of the population uh, down to 10.8% of the population, um, Catholics in that same time span, this is post-Vatican II now, have dropped from 27 down to 23. I really thought that number would have been a lot lower. But in fact, the faith is, I guess, in a technical sense, being maintained. Now, I know many Catholics are lost. I know they they may be showing up to church or they may call themselves Catholics, but but the, the, the catechesis has been horrible. And, and half of them vote for the Democratic Party, for crying out loud, Anthony. But were you shocked when you saw those numbers that it was only down 4%? Considering not only, not only has the culture been so devastating on Catholics, but even Protestants taking you know Catholics away over the past 30 to 40 years. Good question, Frank. Yeah, I was shocked at first, but then I started to realize that, uh, number one, I saw a statistic showing that Catholicism is moving moving south. Um, so the southern United States is becoming more and more Catholic. Now, I believe part of that has to do with Mother Angelica's mission in Alabama and how EWTN has kind of been bringing the faith uh, to the South, most definitely. I've met a lot of Protestants that have, or rather former Protestants that have converted after listening to EWTN, listening to Catholic Answers. I mean, Mother Angelica has did a lot to kickstart things down here. Now, I, I believe there's that, but then also you have to remember that we aren't making replacement rate right here in the United States as far as population goes. It's really falling apart. And we, But what we have had in the South especially is a lot of immigration from Mexico. So that's another reason I think we're really kind of seeing the faith hold on here. And, you know, hopefully we can really fortify the South and we can continue to spread the good news of the Catholic faith and what Jesus Christ wants to give everybody himself, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. He wants you to be able to come to confession. I know so many Protestants, I've heard, I've heard them talk in the past before they converted to Catholicism about how they were always trying to figure out, like, how do I get rid of these sins that I have? They have I've heard they've had little parties where they write down their sins and throw them into a fire, you know. There's all kinds of things that they do. It's, it's funny because they start come on, coming up with traditions with a little T to try and deal with the things that the Catholic Church has always had solutions to. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. I know exactly what you're talking about. So we will say I've always found it interesting, though, that the big cities where, you know, we talk about sort of these migrating patterns of Catholics going to the south. And, you know, but the big cities generally have always been controlled really by They've been large Catholic populations, whether it's Boston or New York or Los Angeles or Philadelphia or Baltimore or Chicago, large pockets of Catholics that have apostatized where the church has had a major role. And yet they've become some of the biggest liberal bastions 
really on the face of the planet. I found that interesting as something I was thinking about just a few weeks back. But I think, you know, again, this is the Vatican II sort of dividing line between devout Catholics and, and, and the Catholics that are kind of just, you know, kind of going through the motion at this point in time. And I think when you talk about the migrations, you're right. Listen, I'm a L.A. boy. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. I now live in the Midwest. I live now in Utah. And so in that sense, you know, and part of our escape was for cultural reasons, because the culture was heading south. The culture was apostatizing in, in, in California. It's it's really another country over there at this point in time. And when we talk about Catholics migrating from New York and Chicago and L.A. and Boston, places like that, I think many families, devout families, a Catholic families, are leaving those pockets of liberalism, of progressivism, whatever you want to call it, and finding refuge in states that have sort of more conservative values in that respect so they can raise their family with some semblance of the faith, Anthony. Yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, uh, we moved to Texas. Uh, we, now, we've always been in the Bible Belt. We were from Tennessee originally. Uh, Texas, I was just shocked when I came here at the number of Catholics. I mean, the churches are absolutely packed. Even at the Novus Ordo Masses, uh, the churches are packed wall to wall uh, with uh, families. Now, if you look up in the Northeast all the way into Canada, for example, I was watching, uh, the other day I was watching a show, excuse me, the other day I was actually watching uh, the Mass broadcast from Canada on YouTube, and it was wall-to-wall -wall women from around their 60s to their 70s, literally, all women. I saw not one man in the crowd, uh, in the congregation there. And uh, that spoke volumes to me because there's been a certain demasculization within the church itself uh, after uh, Vatican II. And it's not even the Vatican II documents that are a problem. When you look at the Vatican II documents on the liturgy, it's clearly supposed to be the Latin Mass. I mean, there's no mistaking it that it's the Mass of the Ages. Uh, what we've had is uh, a problem with the interpretation because of Bunini and other people that got a hold of it and, uh, of course, approved by um, Pope Paul VI. But it's, then there were, there were abuses. There were all kinds of abuses that were going on as well, like uh, communion, communion in the hand and uh, many, many other things that were not supposed to be happening. And eventually the Vatican just gave up because the Vatican was saying, hey, you cannot do that, and they ignored the Vatican. Uh, and it just, this, this spread and the bishops finally just said, okay, well, you know, whatever. And they just went along with it. Kumbaya, everybody. But, uh, now we see, uh, at least I'm seeing down here, especially with the young people, even in the Novus Ordo masses, uh, the young ladies are dressing modestly. They're, uh, wearing, um, uh, a headscarf. They are really serious about the faith. There are lines for confession. Now, this isn't true at every parish down here. Absolutely not. You still see the kooky stuff as well. But I think overall, I think we're seeing a shift with the younger generation. So as we do have this one generation that's becoming more atheistic, we also have a Catholic generation that's becoming much, much stronger Catholics and exploring tradition and wanting to know what the faith really is and what it means. And the spirit of Vatican II, because that's what it is, it's not necessarily the documents, although there are some things that perhaps could be tweaked. It, it's really the spirit of Vatican II that is the biggest issue, and that is going away, my friend. We've got 10, 15, 20 years, and once that generation is gone, I don't, I really don't think we're going to see very many Novus Ordo Masses left. I would be very surprised. Well, I think that's all going to depend on how badly brainwashed the Catholic population is going to be and how far the faith has collapsed. But I think you are right in the sense that if the faith continues to collapse, it will only reside sort of basically in the most faithful and those that want the sort of the traditional Latin mass. Um, and I think that's that's a very important point to remember. But I, I want to take on this, um, the political aspect of this, uh, Anthony, I think you know, when we look at the collapse of the faith in America, politically speaking, um, I think it, it's fair to say that the larger that, you know, or should I say, the more the faith collapses, the greater 
political problems we're going to have in regards to sort of the conservatives or the classical liberals maintaining any type of power. I'm in the camp that believes that the numbers are against sort of the traditional values of the founding fathers and the alignment principles because they've unleashed sort of a can of worms you can't control. I've always said it for many years, once you go down the path of revolution, uh, especially a godless revolution, there's no revolutions in the name of God in my opinion, but once you go down the path of this godless revolution, there's no binding authority to ever, that ever really stops the revolution. You unleash man's passion. I think that's what we're seeing politically at this point in time. And I think, you know, there's been sort of this deep breath that many on the classical liberal side have taken since Donald Trump came into power. But like I keep saying, you know, political power in America or really any democracy is very fluid. And it's only a matter of time until the mechanism of government, the mechanism of media, the mechanism of education that are all combined in it together to bring about, again, the continued revolution to the most logical extreme that is to the far left, eventually work over the population and take control and take power again. Um, my question to you is, listen, just looking at the electoral map here, if classical liberals are going to depend on Ohio and, you know, Wisconsin and Florida every four years, I'm sorry, it doesn't look bright. What is interesting to me about American politics is that red states, they turn purple and eventually they turn blue. But never or hardly ever do we ever see blue states turn red. It just doesn't happen. Anthony. Right. Yeah, it's rare. Um, it happened uh, to some extent with the election of President Trump. I, I believe he'll win again uh, if the economy is able to maintain stability. That said, I think you're right in the long term. We definitely are going to see red states going blue because of generational issues. Um, you know, there's some talk about the generation uh, below the millennials perhaps being more conservative, more church going, all of this kind of thing. I, I have a hard time believing that the infection is not going to spread uh, to such an extent that it's uncontrollable. Uh, it's, it's funny to listen to people like Ben Shapiro and uh, Joe Rogan get together and speak about uh, what's going on in America and how we've got people in political vacuums online and that everything is becoming so toxic now to where basic communication is breaking down. And, and it, it's they, even though they have slightly different opinions, they're essentially both classical liberals, although Joe Rogan might be a little further left than that. But I think we could essentially say that they're both basically classical liberals and they just can't seem to figure out the problems as far as solutions. They can identify these problems. They have some basic idea for solutions, but then it's like, well, they, the, the, the discussion never really goes anywhere as far as a solution. Well, the Catholic Church has always had the solution. There's a reason that people are not charitable anymore. There's a reason why people are treating each other like garbage. Uh, I found one thing Ben Shapiro pointed out quite interesting. He talked about how in uh, countries that are having these major issues um, as far as holding together with the social fabric of society, they're driving degrades as, as that's happening. They, they don't even respect the laws of the road anymore, and he named off some countries. Uh, I, would, I, I think you can see that in American cities. Uh, more and more in the DFW area, I got out of there, but more and more in the DFW area and other other cities in Texas, and these are blue on the map, Frank. They're definitely blue. It's Look, <laughs> flyover country here in Texas is red, and the cities are blue. And in the cities, I mean, people are being shot. There's all kinds of road... I mean, being shot in road rage, road rage cases. There's all kinds of anger out there, and people are becoming increasingly uh, unstable. And as individuals are increasingly becoming unhinged, it's only a matter of time before society becomes completely unhinged. And so I don't think it's a coincidence, as you, as you spoke to earlier, that we are seeing some Catholic migration away from the cities and definitely into the South. Uh, I have a friend up in the Northeast, and... <laughs> 
things are definitely interesting up there. I've had some, quite the conversations with him about the things he's running into. And really, honestly, for Catholics in some of those areas in the north and in Canada, they're going to have to make a decision eventually. It's coming down the road for them. Am I going to choose my faith or am I going to choose my job? And that's, that's really where the rubber is meeting the road, Frank. Yeah, 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 I know. I made that decision 15 years ago to get out of the city um, because it was getting rough for many different reasons. Um, and, and faith is one of them, but, you know, financial issues as well, too, economic issues as well, too. I think, uh, Anthony, when we look at the situation with Catholics and sort of the political sort of ramifications of, a, of an apostatized culture, we have to try and understand or try and relate uh, in a way where, you know, where do we go from here, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Because, you know, the classical liberals are stuck in this, you know, left and right debate, and they believe that they can philosophize their way and, and, and apply that philosophy sort of the, to the electoral process to try and make change to civilization. But what we've seen in America alone, and, and this really extends out to all of the Western republics or all of the Western democracies, is that the countries and the civilization as a whole is constantly shifting to the left. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is like we, we listen to talk radio, Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, Dennis Prager, Mark Levin, these guys all have ideas. And some of these ideas are actually pretty good in some ways. But there's no enforcement mechanism on the population. Because again, the undercutting rule is personal liberty, individual liberty. You can suggest good ideas, you can advise good ideas, but at the end of the day, people can reject all your ideas. And what do you do once people reject the good ideas that you've come up with? I mean, this is sort of the, really the, the, the cluster of insanity of what I call the classical liberals who, who you know, who want to lead the charge to change our, our, our society and a revolution, and yet the country only goes further and further to the left. What do we do, Anthony? Well, I think in some sense we, we pray, definitely. I mean, everybody should be doing the rosary, everybody, a daily rosary. That's what Our Lady said to do. And as a matter of fact, she also wants us doing the Seven Sorrows rosary. I have managed to get to the point to where I'm doing the Seven Sorrows and the rosary. I, I need to start doing the Seven Sorrows rosary again as well. Uh, prayer foremost, we're battling principalities and powers and so that's how the um that's how the shift can take place it'll be a shift in consciousness it'll, it's a shift in healing we have to suffer for other people that are falling into these sinful ways individually that uh, and i you know jordan peterson dr jordan peterson is another good example of somebody who can identify problems fairly well but has no real viable solution because he's also a part of the classical liberal cult and so, um, as far as I can tell, now perhaps he's changing uh, internally, maybe he's changing his mind, maybe he's headed for the Catholic faith, I hope he is. But, um, yeah, so there's, there's problems. There's problems when you have individuals that are becoming increasingly unhinged, as Dr. Jordan Peterson points out, because he believes, and I think he's right, that every, he wouldn't call it a sin, I would, I would call it a sin, every individual sin that is committed takes us one step closer to the society completely collapsing. And we can look at history. There have been studies done on this where, not just with music, music is a big part of it, and I don't want to digress too much into that, but you can see changes in music that really does not meet right reason, and at the same time you also see a shift in the culture then. It's not the culture that shifts first, it's the music that shifts first. And we have a rock and roll culture here essentially in the United States. Um, and you know, if you want to move people spiritually into a bad place, um, it's, 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 it's the way to go. It works. Look, rock and roll has its roots in voodoo. Even uh, people like David Bowie knew this. Now, now, in some cases, uh, that genre of music could perhaps have uh, a place where it meets right reason, uh, depending on circumstances and what you're doing. But 
it certainly is one of the big reasons why our culture is collapsing. It's one of the things that isn't touched on. Also, there are cycles. We've, we've seen these cycles happen in history over and over again repeatedly where we have civilizations collapse and they collapse in much the same way. Once you get to this point in, in history, it's been identified by many people uh, in the academic community that you, where you start seeing issues like uh, transgenderism and this type of thing really increasing. As a matter, you're very close to civilizational collapse. As a matter of fact, Jesus' prophecy about the temple collapsing, uh, and this did ha it was fulfilled in 70 AD. Uh, some of the highlights of that are very disturbing. The Jews locked the Romans out. They were cannibalizing themselves inside the city, and there were men running around dressed like women murdering people. Uh, so it's the same story over and over and over again, and, and it has a lot to do with the loss of masculine identity, and that loss of masculine identity has, I think, a lot to do with the loss of uh, the moral life, the spiritual life, the prayer life that keeps us connected to God, who is our source of everything and so we just, I think we're at, we're at the end, Frank. We're at the end of a civilizational period here. And uh, I can only imagine what St. Augustine would say about us, considering what he saw with Rome's collapse. Yeah, yeah. I was watching um, the Netflix special on Malachi Martin, Hostage to the Devil. And in that, you know, documentary uh, listening to malachi martin's voice and i know there is um wide sort of differing opinions on malachi martin okay and and, and just to preface it what i'm about to say is while i may not completely trust malachi martin i like listening to him and toward the end of his life i thought the man did convert back to the faith and was being as honest as he could before he met his maker um and before he he stood in before the throne of Christ, and he said that something has happened here in our civilization, and the old Catholic world is now about to come to an end, and there will be a, a civilizational shift at some point that will kind of be sort of that you know awakening moment or that 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 you know moment of chastisement, whatever you want to call it. That's gonna it's gonna turn the world over into the next epoch of human civilization. Now, what that is, I don't know. We got to leave that into God's hands and have trust in him and always be prepared and have faith in our Lord in that sense. But something has shifted. And I think, again, as I keep pointing out, it's the Protestant Reformation. It's where it begins. The idea of the individual conscience is taken to the next level during the Enlightenment, and it's been all downhill ever since. You could point to me about the fake prosperity we have, the death society we have. You could talk to me about the technology. I'm not sure if technology makes us a better people. In fact, I think uh, I think it makes us more lazy and apathetic and, 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 and really all the vices that we can imagine in many ways. Not that I don't enjoy some of those luxuries. Don't get me wrong, but I think it also has a negative effect. You highlighted that, Anthony, with um, you know a lot of the pleasures that we partake of at this given time. It's just civilization has shifted. And, you know, as I keep telling many of my friends, especially those on the political right, listen, you don't need to look at the news every night. You don't need to look at Fox News. You don't need to read the Internet. I said, look at your families. Examine your families. Your families are being torn apart in one way or another. Whether it's immediate family or extended family, nobody is surviving the great apostasy. And most of us that are still barely holding on to the faith as it is are worried about our children, uh, our children's generation, and whether they're going to survive this great apostasy. It's going to take great faith to get through this period of time, especially as this world becomes more hedonistic. And what this study proves in the end is that we are on the trajectory that we have always feared, and nobody wants to deal with this in a real kind of way. Every time I propose these ideas, and I think this is why I left the conservative movement, because every time I propose a lot of these ideas that the civilization and the culture is falling apart based upon these principles of the Enlightenment and the Protestant Reformation, and I point out, listen, look at this, look at this, look at this. The only thing I would get from them is, calm down, Frank. Now's not the time to panic. And I've gotten tired of being told to calm down. 
You know, this country has aborted 60 plus million children since Roe v. Wade. Are we supposed to just live with that? This country just a few years back legalized sodomite marriage. This country has sterilized our women over the past 60 years via contraception. We are now accepting every form of moral and sexual degeneracy that has ever been, you know, could possibly be, you know, thought of at this point in time. I mean, we are a Sodom and Gomorrah. And listen, while I love my home country, I love my nation. I love where I live and everything that I've been given, many of the gifts that I've been given. There comes a point in time where we just can't wave the flag. We just can't be cheerleaders for ourselves. Just as, you know what, Anthony, as I go to confession every week and do an examination of conscience, I'm going to conduct that same examination of conscience for my family and for my country as well, too. It's time that we analyze and critically analyze, I should say, the, our, the, the sins of our nation and begin to call it out. And that's not just picking on America. That's all the nations of Western civilization. It's time that we come out and say enough is enough. No more cheerleading. It's time to stand for truth. Yes, I can't agree more, Frank. And, you know, the right is really going to have to get on board with this. That's the biggest problem. And it's like you say, and it's true, uh, they generally always lose over time. They might have a few small victories here and there, but over time, they always lose. And the reason they always lose is for, you know, there's things they don't want to have to deal with. And one of those things is going to have to be a reassessment of their individual lives and their individual families. We've got to pull the cohesive structure of America back together the way it used to be, where we didn't used to know what divorce was, where we had large families, where people were focused on God and not material uh, substances. It's one thing to pursue material things in order to live and meet basic needs. It's another to have everything you want and on demand 24-7 to satisfy that pleasure center of your brain. That's not what God created it for. We must do what meets right reason. And uh, I would just encourage Protestants to go back and listen to our talk on Sola Scriptura that we did on your podcast because I think it's so important to really understand why the Catholic faith is legitimate, to have a historical sense, a true historical sense of where the Bible came from and who had the authority to bind that Bible. Absolutely. And I think, my friend, that's going to wrap it up for tonight. It's been a great conversation. Again, <laughs> atheism on the rise in America. Am I shocked? Are we shocked? No, we're not. But this is what we're pointing out, and it's because nobody else, either on the left or the right, is talking about it. Well, let me take that back. Actually, people on the left are talking about it, because I've been in some of those atheist chat rooms, too. They're actually celebrating the rise of atheism now as being the largest religion in America. Ladies and gentlemen, these are dark times. These are strange times. These are unparalleled times here, not only in America, but throughout all of Western civilization. I want to thank you, Anthony Chioda, for joining me tonight, buddy. You have a good night, okay? Thanks for having me, Frank. I appreciate it. You too. God bless, sir. Ah, God bless you too, brother. Okay, this is Frank signing off for the Knights of Christendom. Good night, everybody. <laughs>